Hello, and welcome to the final round of the 2023 Canadian Geographic Challenge. My name is Christian Stenner, and I am an explorer, researcher, and fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and I am thrilled to be joining you as the host of today's big event. Today I'm in Ottawa, Ontario at the headquarters of the Canadian Geographic and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, also known as Canada's Centre for Geography and Exploration. The centre is located at the confluence of the Ottawa, Gatineau and Rideau Rivers, a highly significant gathering place of the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. The Algonquin have a long-standing relationship with this territory which remains unceded. On behalf of the entire Canadian Geographic Challenge team, I acknowledge that this land is a source of identity for the Algonquin people who have always nurtured and protected it, that this land has been profoundly altered by colonial disruptions, and that we all have a role to play in reconciling the historical relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people who call Canada home. I would also like to recognize that the work of the society Canadian Geographic and CanGeo Education, including the Canadian Geographic Challenge, reaches across all the distinct First Nations, Métis homeland, and Inuit, Nunanat. For this, we are grateful. The Canadian Geographic Challenge is a national student competition, currently in its 28th year, that invites thousands of students with a passion for geography and exploration to showcase their knowledge and fieldwork skills in a series of classroom, school, provincial, territorial, and national level tests. The challenge encourages a sense of wonder and an appreciation for the natural world and our place in it. As a cave explorer and cartographer, I've seen firsthand the beauty of wild and hidden places all around the world as well as the many impacts of human pressures on the global system, including the biodiversity and health of underground cave systems. As a young person, I used to draw maps by tracing them uh, on top of atlases and looking at the political boundaries. And then I started to try to draw them from memory. Eventually, I started to add in mountains and rivers. And I had no idea when I was young that I would eventually be drawing maps of places that no human has ever been to before. And tying those maps to the locations of places where we've discovered life that had never been known to exist before. Geography is an amazing tool for us to learn more about our natural world and our place in it. This year's participants and their teachers have gone above and beyond to demonstrate their love and commitment to geographic literacy and to our planet. And for that, I'd like to applaud each and every one of you. You are the heart of the Canadian Geographic Challenge, and we would not be here today without you. Thank you for bringing so much passion and enthusiasm to this program and to everyone around you. The team and I are especially proud of the dedication shown by this year's top 20 national finalists who competed in a rather difficult series of written and fieldwork tests in the lead up to today's event. You rose to the occasion and thoroughly impressed our judges with your extensive knowledge of all things geography. Today's event is a celebration of five of these very special individuals who ranked the highest among their peers in this year's top 20. So, what are we waiting for? Let's meet this year's top five national finalists of the Canadian Geographic Challenge. I'm gonna introduce them one by one in no particular order, and I will ask each finalist a question so that we can get to know them a little better before the start of the competition. Let's welcome our first competitor, Colin Lay, who is in grade 10 at Markville Secondary School in Markham, Ontario. Welcome, Colin. Congratulations on the tremendous accomplishment of making it to the national final. Colin, I'd love to know, as I'm sure our audience would as well, what is a memorable place you have visited and why was it memorable? Um, one of my most memorable places I visited was definitely Vancouver, British Columbia. I just really like the, uh, the combination of the scenic views and then the uh, bustling city landscape. And I really like uh, uh, Stanley Park because it's a great escape from uh, the city itself and 
it's really relaxing there. And the city has so many trails and hiking that can take place. And I just really like that. Thank you very much, Colin, and best of luck today. Next, we have Peter Dimitrov, who is in grade nine at Centennial Regional High School in Brossard, Quebec. Peter, you must be feeling very proud today, and rightfully so. Tell me, why is geography important to you? So geography was always something I really loved. Since I was five years old, I just opened many geography books, and I was really curious. I learned that I started to be really good in it, and it was a really good hobby of mine that I keep on doing it. I can't believe that I'm right here because I didn't really work hard on it. I just loved it. The geography is very important because you should know everything around you. And it is not like, you know, searching a place on a map. It is more like knowing, okay, about the wildlife, about where everything is and what's around you. It's basically like a new sense that you can really learn. I know you said that you didn't work hard, but Think about it this way. If you do what you love, it's not really work. So that's awesome. Thank you. Now, let's welcome Christian Krolvetsky, who is in grade nine at Resurrection Catholic Secondary School in Kitchener, Ontario. Welcome, Christian, and a big congratulations to you. I would love to hear a little bit about why you like geography. So I remember back when I was like six years old, I got my hand on a first atlas and I just loved all the like the little secrets you can find where like you can stare at a map for hours and not find like you know half of what you're searching for like you can find oh there's like a little city there or oh this is a cool lake and because i also love travel it, it's also really cool to like see those places on a map and then actually be there and i think that's what brought me into geography first is just the wonder of what you can find on a map that's amazing. That seems a lot like my story where I was drawing maps and using that as a vehicle to help discover new places and places to visit and all of the possibilities involved. Thank you, Christian. Good luck in today's competition. Our next competitor is Pavlos Konstas, a grade 10 student from London Central Secondary School in London, Ontario. Welcome to the stage, Pavlos. My question for you is, what do you find exciting about geography? Uh, well, geography uh, is so great because it teaches you about how the world is organized and how it functions. One of my favorite subjects in school is chemistry, which teaches us how the world around us functions on a microscopic level. So all of the atoms and all of the interactions between them. But geography tells us uh, the bigger picture, how the world works around us on a macroscopic scale, how rivers and societies interact with each other. And it provides us a whole new perspective on how the world works. Thank you, Pavlos. I share your enthusiasm. Geography really is at the center of our understanding of how the world works. And finally, we have Dhruv Shukla, a grade nine student from Maple High School in Woodbridge, Ontario. Dhruv, well done, my friend. This is quite the accomplishment. Tell me about a memorable place you have visited and why it had an impact on you. So uh, the most memorable place I've been to is probably Niagara Falls. And uh, it's, it's probably because my family lives pretty close to it, like 100 kilometers away. And we go there at least like twice a year. And it's always amazing to see like uh, how like the valleys and uh, the stuff have uh, been created, like where the river flows after it falls off Niagara Falls, uh, just from like land erosion. And one fascinating thing that I think about Niagara is like, even if the temperature is like negative 20 in the winters, the falls never freezes, which is pretty crazy because the water should freeze uh, at like zero degrees. Thank you, Drew. And thank you all for sharing your inspiring ideas with me and our audience. I'll say it again, congratulations on making it to the national final. Now, before we get the competition underway, let's review how the event is going to proceed. There are five rounds in the national final today, which include three Dutch auction questions. Each round will have a different theme and approximately eight to 10 questions. I will read each question out loud and each of you will write your answer in the online form and hit submit. You will be given 20 seconds to answer each question, which will be tracked by our official timer. When the time is up, 
you will hear this sound. You will not lose points for wrong answers. If you do not know the answer, please respond with a question mark so we know there is no technical issue with the form. If you do not submit your answer before the 20 seconds are up, you will not be marked on that question. All questions are worth one point, with the exception of the Dutch auction questions, which I will explain later in the competition. We have official scorekeepers behind the scenes, working with our judges, and I will let you know your scores at the end of each round. During the course of the competition, you were each allowed two opportunities to ask for a question to be repeated. The official scorekeepers will keep track of this. Once an answer has been revealed, if you would like to challenge the answer, you may do so by raising your hand before the next question is read. The judges will review your answer and determine whether it is acceptable or not. Throughout the competition, spelling does not count as long as the judges are able to determine what your answer is. If you feel that the judges have marked your answer incorrectly, you are allowed to challenge them up to two times during the course of the competition. Judges' decisions are final. Please keep your microphones on mute during each round. If you need to communicate something, raise your hand and wait to be unmuted before speaking. After all five rounds are complete, if there is a tie for first, second, or third place, we will move to a sudden win tiebreaker round. If this is the case, I'll give further instructions at that point. Now, please raise your hand if you have any questions and I'll be happy to answer them. I see that there are no questions. So everyone take a moment to collect your thoughts and calm your nerves and in a minute we will begin. We are going to begin the competition today with a round in honor of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This initiative, which the UN launched in 2021, is a massive undertaking that aims to raise awareness of the many problems currently faced by the global ocean and the scientific research needed to solve them. The project's motto is, the science we need for the ocean we want. And by 2030, the UN hopes that the world will have more of both. There are nine questions in this round, each worth one point. Is everyone ready? Okay, let's get started with our first round. Here's your first question. Which marine organism is responsible for producing about 50% of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere? The answer is phytoplankton or algae. Second question, one of the ecologically harmful effects of certain commercial fishing methods is the unintended capture of non-target species. Often, fishermen will throw away these species because they don't want them or aren't allowed to keep them due to regulations. These species can include fish, dolphins, whales, sea turtles, and even seabirds that get caught or tangled in fishing gear. What is the collective term for these non-target species? The answer is bycatch. Moving on to the third question. A mass coral bleaching event from 2014 to 2017 affected more than 70% of coral reefs around the world. It was made worse by a climate phenomenon that raises ocean temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. What is the phenomenon called? The answer is El Nino. Our fourth question is, which critically endangered whale species whose feeding grounds can be found along the eastern coast of Canada has fewer than 360 individuals living in the wild, having been hunted to near extinction by the late 1800s. The answer is the North Atlantic right whale. On to question five. The Gulf Stream, a well-studied current in the Atlantic Ocean, 
brings warmer and saltier waters to the Arctic Ocean. This causes a shift in water stratification that melts sea ice from the bottom and contributes to warmer surface temperatures. What is this phenomenon called? The answer is Atlantification. We're halfway through the first round. Here's question number six. When an excess of nutrients enters estuaries or coastal waters, it can result in harmful algal blooms and plant growth, dead zones, and fish mortality. What is the term for this process? The answer is eutrophication. Question number seven. In conservation practices, trees, shrubs, and perennial plants can be planted to help protect bodies of water, such as streams, lakes, rivers, and coastal areas. They help prevent erosion and can filter excess nutrients as well as pesticides from agricultural runoff. What is the term for these vegetation zones? The answer is riparian buffer. Moving on to question eight. In 1992, the Canadian government put in place the cod moratorium in an attempt to save declining cod stocks, thereby putting 30,000 people out of work and ending the cod fishery, which had been an integral part of which province's economy? The answer is Newfoundland and Labrador. The ninth and last question is, in Canada, there exists a globally unique ecosystem that was once thought to have gone extinct millions of years ago. In 1987, scientists discovered a special type of living reef system made up of organisms with skeletal structures made of silica. What are these reef organisms called? The answer is glass sponges. Now, before we check in with the judges for the scores from this round, we have a special type of question called a Dutch auction question. For this question, four clues will be read. You have the option of answering after each clue. However, once you have answered, you may not change your response following another clue. If you answer incorrectly, you will not receive any points. If you answer correctly after the first clue, you will receive four points. If you answer correctly after the second clue, you will receive three points. If you answer correctly after the third clue, you will receive two points. And after the fourth clue, you'll receive one point. To answer, please type your response and hit submit. The judges will keep track of your points. The answer to the judge auction question will be read after the final clue. Here we go. Name this body of water. For four points, your first clue is the Calypso Deep, which is the deepest point in the Mediterranean Sea, is located in this body of water at a depth of 5,267 meters. For three points, in the Odyssey, a famous epic poem by the ancient Greek poet Homer, the hero Odysseus wanders for 10 years, trying to return home after the Trojan War. He is the king of Ithaca, which is an island in this body of water. For two points, this body of water is home to islands such as Corfu, Kefalonia, Zakynthos, and Lefkada. Okay, it looks like we have all of our answers in. The answer to this question is the Ionian Sea. And that concludes our first round. Great job, everyone. Our judges are tabulating the results, which we'll see momentarily. Okay, so after round one, the leader is Pavlos with 10 points. Next up is Colin with nine points. Then Druv with seven points. Christian is next with four points and Peter with three points. Now, 
Let's head into our second round, which draws on your knowledge of geology and earth science. Geology and geography go hand in hand. Geology is concerned with the physical structure, substance, evolution, and dynamics of the earth. Whereas geography is the study of place and the relationships between people and their environments. To deepen our understanding of the planet, its processes, and our role as stewards, we must look at areas of concern and opportunities for improvement from a perspective that combines all aspects of the Earth sciences. Observing the Earth from space helps with this too. This round will feature 10 questions, each worth one point. Is everyone ready? Okay, let's get round two underway. First question, what is the name for the type of fault in which the rock on one side of the fault plane has moved downward relative to the other side? The accepted answers are a normal fault or a dip-slip fault. Question two, scientists have proposed that we are living in a new geological epoch characterized by an irreversible shift in the functioning of the Earth's natural processes and a permanent restructuring of the Earth's surface. What is the name of this proposed epoch? The answer is the Anthropocene. Third question. Without a protective region of space acting like a buffer around the Earth, the relentless action of solar particles would strip the Earth of its atmosphere. What is the name of this protective region of space? The answer is the magnetosphere. Moving on to the fourth question. What is the most abundant chemical element in the Earth's crust by mass? The answer is oxygen. We're at the halfway point for round two. Here's your fifth question. Which volcano erupted approximately 2,400 years ago and is commonly referred to as Canada's most active volcano? The answer is Mount Meager. Question number six. Often found on steep slopes, what is the term for a type of river that splits into multiple channels which continuously weave together and apart, forming temporary sediment bars? The answer is a braided river or a braided stream. Question seven, Indonesia has had some of the largest and deadliest volcanic eruptions in history. What is the name of their most active volcano, which erupted in 2010, resulting in hundreds of casualties and forcing thousands from their homes? The answer is Mount Merapi. Here's question number eight. Mammoth Cave National Park is home to the world's longest known cave system with more than 640 kilometers of explored underground passages and tunnels. In which US state is it located? The answer is Kentucky. Here's the second last question for this round. In the rock cycle, what process would limestone have to go through to become marble? The answer is heat and pressure, also known as metamorphism. Also acceptable would be crystallization. And now the final question for round two. What is the term for the narrowest part of an alluvial fan? And what is the term for the broad part? You must answer both correctly to receive the point. The 
The answer is the narrow part is called the apex and the broad part is the apron. And that's the end of round two. So the judges are tabulating the scores. This is the cumulative score of round one and round two. In the lead is Pavlos with 14 points. Next up, we have Dhruv with 13 points, then Colin with 11 points, then Christian with six points, and then Peter with three points. You guys are doing a great job. Let's keep up the momentum. We're now heading into round three, which focuses on the theme of conflict and peace. Around the world today, there are ongoing armed conflicts and human rights injustices, many of which have roots in historical wars, ethnic clashes, gender inequalities, and territorial disputes. Learning our history is crucial to better understanding one another and to forming stronger relationships with our neighbors at home and around the world. It is even more important to recognize that there are many examples of peaceful solutions where nations have come together to put an end to strife, find common ground, and create institutions and laws that protect human rights. This round will explore not only historical and current day conflicts, but also treaties and organizations focused on peace and prosperity. This round features 10 questions, each worth one point. Is everyone ready? Okay, let's dive in. Here's your first question. The International Criminal Court is an intergovernmental organization and tribunal with jurisdiction over international crimes, such as genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. In which city is the court's seat located. The answer is The Hague. Question number two. Which African country experienced a civil war that lasted from 1991 to 2002, characterized by extreme violence from the rebel United Front? The answer is Sierra Leone. Third question. The War of 1812 was fought between the United States and Britain. Canada played a major role in the conflict as a British colony and relied on the support of First Nations allies. Which treaty officially ended the War of 1812? The answer is the Treaty of Ghent. Moving on to the fourth question. The provinces of Patani, Yala, and Narathiwat have served as the site of a separatist insurgency for decades. In which Southeast Asian country are these provinces located? The answer is Thailand. Question five. Which country was the site of the first and only successful slave revolution, leading to their independence from French colonial rule in 1804? The answer is Haiti. Question number six. There are six official languages of the United Nations. Three of the languages are English, Chinese, and French. Name the other three official languages for a full point. The answer is Arabic, Russian, and Spanish. We're moving on to question seven. Poverty and violence due to political unrest drug trafficking and gang warfare have caused a surge in migrants to North America in recent years from Central and South America. One of the areas most affected is referred to as the Northern Triangle. Name two of the three countries in this region for a full point. Possible answers include 
El Salvador, Guatemala, or Honduras? Question eight, which Nordic country is not a member state of the European Union? The answer is Norway. Here's the second last question for this round. Which two countries have an elaborate ceremonial changing of the guard at the Atari Waga border that resulted from a partition enforced after the departure of British colonial rule? Name both countries for the full point. The answer is India and Pakistan. And the last question of round three is, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae wrote the famous poem In Flanders Fields to honor a friend who died in one of the first major battles fought by Canadian troops in the First World War. This battle took place on April 22nd, 1915. What is the name of this battle? The answer is the Battle of Ypres. Okay, before we check in with the scoreboard for the third round, we have another Dutch auction question. As a reminder, here's how the point system works. Four clues will be read. You have the option of answering after each clue. However, once you have answered, you may not change your response following another clue. If you answer incorrectly, you will not receive any points. If you answer correctly after the first clue, you will receive four points after the second clue, three points, and so on. When you know the answer, type it in and hit submit. The judges will keep track of the scores. The answer to the Dutch auction question will be read after the final clue. Is everybody ready? Okay, here we go. Name this treaty. For four points, your first clue is, this treaty is recognized as the oldest treaty between the first peoples of Turtle Island and European settlers. For three points, this treaty features two purple rows on a white background, symbolizing two vessels traveling down the same river. Meaning, each nation has their own laws, customs, and ways of knowing and being that are equally valid. For two points, this treaty was negotiated in 1613 between the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. For one point, this treaty was not recorded on paper, but was instead made up of many purple and white beads carved from mollusk shells and quahog clams, which can be found on the shores of lakes and rivers in Haudenosaunee territory. The answer is the two-row wampum belt. Okay, the judges have tabulated the score after this round. Again, this is the cumulative score of all of the rounds together. In the lead, we have Pavlos with 25 points. Next up, we have Colin with 23 points. Dhruv with 22 points. Peter with eight points. And Christian with seven points. We're past the halfway mark for the 2023 Cangio Challenge National Final. Everyone keep up the amazing work as we head into round four, which is all about weather and climate. From strange weather phenomena and natural disasters to the everyday processes that help us predict the weather forecast, the world of meteorology and climatology is full of fascinating facts and surprises. In this round, We'll explore the Earth's atmosphere and the systems that keep our planet functioning, as well as the consequences of upsetting the balance through climate change. There are 10 questions in this round, each worth one point. Is everybody ready? Okay, let's begin round four. Here's your first question. What is the name for the atmospheric circulation pattern that influences climate in the tropics, with hot air rising at the equator and sinking at 30 degrees latitude, both in the north and south? The answer is 
Hadley cell. Question number two. What is the term for the process by which air and moisture rise from the warm surface of the earth into the atmosphere, often leading to the formation of thunderstorms? The answer is convection. Moving on to the third question. What is the name for the phenomenon where air temperature increases with height, which can result in smog due to pollutants becoming trapped near the surface of the earth? The answer is a temperature inversion or a thermal inversion. Question number four. Most clouds sit in the troposphere layer of the atmosphere. Which type of cloud can sometimes reach beyond the troposphere into the lower stratosphere? The answer is cumulonimbus clouds. Other possible answers may include stratospheric, as in polar stratospheric clouds, and cirrus clouds. Question five. One of the worst typhoons on record, the Category 5 storm, known as Super Typhoon Haiyan, caused widespread devastation across Southeast Asia in 2013. Which country was most affected by this natural disaster with a death toll of more than 6,000? The answer is the Philippines. Question number six. Relative humidity is the measure of the amount of moisture in the air relative to the maximum amount it could hold at a given temperature. What instrument do meteorologists use to measure humidity? The answer is a hygrometer. Moving on to question seven. Which country has the highest carbon dioxide emissions per capita, more than twice the global average? The answer is the United States. Question eight. The ozone layer is responsible for absorbing the majority of the sun's harmful radiation. A group of chemical coolants that were once used in refrigerators and aerosol sprays led to the thinning of the ozone layer, which is still not fully recovered today. Which chemical element did these coolants release into the atmosphere? The answer is chlorine. Other acceptable answer is CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons. Here's the second last question of the round. What is the name for a type of destructive windstorm that is associated with rapidly moving thunderstorms and typically causes damage in one direction along a relatively straight line? The answer is a derecho. This is the final question for round four. The Köppen climate classification is a widely used system that corresponds to vegetation zones. The classification is divided into several main climate types based on seasonal precipitation and temperature. Of the main climate classifications, how many types are there? The answer is five. And that's the end of round four. We are heading into the home stretch. Our judges are tabulating the results. And here we go, the collective results of the competition so far. Pavlos is in the lead with 33 points, followed by Colin with 28 points. Then Drew with 27 points, Christian with 10 points, and Peter with nine points. This is our final round of the 2023 Canadian Geographic Challenge National Final. To finish off the competition, we're focusing on human geography. There are now nearly eight billion people living in the world, 
with a net gain of one person every 19 seconds. That's about as long as you have to answer each question in this round. We live in a multicultural world full of diverse voices and perspectives, and it is more important now than ever before to acknowledge and empower all peoples around the world, especially Indigenous peoples, in preserving their cultural heritage. This round will celebrate human achievements, cultures from around the world, and the ties that bind us. This round has nine questions, each worth one point. All right, is everyone ready for our final round? Okay, let's get started. Question number one. In the last two decades, the world reached a population milestone. According to the United Nations, this was the first time that more people lived in urban areas than rural areas. Which year marked this shift in urban living? The answer is 2007. Question number two. In the last census of the Canadian population, there were more than 250 ethnic origins or ancestries recorded. What is the largest non-European ethnic group in Canada with about 1.8 million people? The answer is Chinese. Moving on to question three. More than 70 distinct indigenous languages are spoken across Canada which fall into 12 separate language families. Some of these languages have thousands of fluent speakers, while others are on the brink of extinction. What is the most spoken Indigenous language among First Nations people in Atlantic Canada? The answer is Mi'kmaq. Question number four. Listen closely to the following list of historical sites and think about when they were built. Machu Picchu, the Colosseum, Petra, Scarabray, Angkor Wat. Which of these historical sites is the oldest? The answer is Scarabray. Question number five. Which city has the most skyscrapers in the world with more than 480 buildings over 150 meters tall? The answer is Hong Kong. We're halfway through this last round. Question number six. These indigenous people originating in the plains and highlands of Mesopotamia are now spread throughout the mountainous regions of present-day Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. The majority are Sunni Muslims and have their own distinct language and culture. What is the name of this ethnic group? The answer is the Kurds or Kurdish people. Question seven is, what took 10 years to build and officially opened on November 17, 1869, revolutionizing trade by connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean? The answer is the Suez Canal. Moving on to question eight. Which island nation asks visitors to sign a passport pledge to act in an ecologically and culturally responsible way for the sake of future generations. The pledge reads, I vow to tread lightly, act kindly, and explore mindfully. I shall not take what is not given. I shall not harm what does not harm me. The only footprints I shall leave are those that will wash away. The answer is Palau. We're almost at the end. Here's question nine. What term refers to a common language, which historically has been used among speakers of different languages for the purposes of trade and commerce? The 
The answer is lingua franca. Before we conclude this competition, I would like to read one final Dutch auction question. As a reminder, here's how the point system works. Four clues will be read out. You have the option of answering after each clue. Once you have answered, you may not change your response following another clue. If you answer incorrectly, you will not receive any points. If you answer correctly after the first clue, you will receive four points. If you answer correctly after the second clue, you'll receive three points. If you answer correctly after the third clue, you'll receive two points. And after the fourth clue, you'll receive one point. When you know the answer, type it in and hit submit. The judges will keep track of the scores. The answer to the Dutch auction question will be read after the final clue. Is everyone ready for the very last question of the national final? Okay, here we go. Name this country. For four points, this country is considered the birthplace of winemaking. Their tradition of using earthenware vessels called quervi, used for making, aging, and storing the wine, is a tradition recognized by UNESCO. For three points, during its golden age, one of its rulers was King David IV, known as the Builder. It was during his reign that the Gelati Monastery was built in 1106, which is today a UNESCO World Heritage Site. For two points, in 2008, this country was invaded by Russia, who now occupies two of its territories. This country was also the birthplace of former Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin. Okay, it looks like we have all of the responses in from all of the competitors. The answer is Georgia. Amazing finale, everyone. Let's give them a well-deserved round of applause. Now, let's let the judges tally the final scores. And now for the final result, let's take a look at the scores. Pavlos has 42 points. Colin has 37 points. Dhruv has 36 points. Peter has 15 points. And Christian has 13 points. So we officially now have our winners. Is everyone ready? The third place winner is Drew Shukla. He will receive a cash prize of $1,000 and a prize pack from Canadian Geographic. Great job. The second place winner is Colin Lake. He will receive a cash prize of $2,000 and a prize pack from Canadian Geographic. Way to go! The first place winner and champion of this year's Can Geo Challenge is Pavlos Constas. He will receive $3,000 and a prize pack from Canadian Geographic. Congratulations! Our fourth and fifth place runners up are Peter Dimitro and Christian Kolovetsky. They will be receiving some great prize packs from Canadian Geographic. Join me in congratulating their amazing efforts today. We have come to the end of the 2023 Canadian Geographic Challenge. I just want to take this time to say thank you to our finalists. The Can Geo Challenge, from the classroom level to the national final, highlights the importance of geography and being a geo-literate citizen. The five of you embody what it means to be geographically literate, lifelong learners who value global citizenship. You exemplify the values of the challenge, Can Geo Education, Canadian Geographic, and the Society. All of you have really impressed us with your knowledge of Canada, the world, and the issues affecting our communities here at home and around the world. I would like to thank you and all 20 of our national finalists who did such a wonderful job with their tests this year. I would also like to thank your families and teachers who have supported you along the way. And finally, 
Thanks go out to the CanGeo staff, the Society's Explorers and Fellows, our judges, and the audience for tuning in. Congratulations to our winners once again, and best of luck in your own personal journeys. Now, go and celebrate and continue exploring the world around you.